Well, good evening. Let's, we're going to get started. Um, my name is Mark Strauss. Um, I am a New Testament professor at Bethel Seminary. I used to say Bethel Seminary San Diego, but they closed the San Diego campus. So I still teach for Bethel, but I teach fully online. Um, and rising from the ashes of Bethel Seminary San Diego is a new school called Pacific Theological Seminary. If you know anyone who is interested in seminary education, um, um, Pacific is online, and I mean, they're, they're, they've got a website, <laughs> they're not online, they're face-to-face, they're face -face, but they are launching, they just launched in the spring, um, and um, they, they are really moving forward. So if you have any interest, you can talk to me, and I, I'll share that information. Um, love to connect you with the school. Um, I've been teaching here at North Coast with the School of Ministry for a number of years, and I often teach two classes in the School of Ministry. I teach one on hermeneutics, or Biblical interpretation, that's what we did last week. Um, I also teach one on Bible translation, and um, I have to say this topic is near and dear to my heart. Um, I serve on the, the NIV Translation Committee, the Committee on Bible Translation for the New International Version. Um, I've had a love of language for, for a long time. Um, I've worked on a number of other translations, the New Century Version, a version called the Expanded Bible, um, worked with the New Living Translation for a little while as well, um, but this is a, a, a topic that I'm fascinated with, um, and it is a critically important topic because the vast majority of us um, read and hear God's Word, not by reading the original Greek and Hebrew, um, but by reading it in English translation, and so that makes the English translations that we use incredibly important. What makes a translation good? What makes a translation accurate? That's some of the things I want to talk about today. I want to start, um, we'll have a little fun to start off with. I'm, I'm a lover of language, a, a linguophile, that's what I call it, a linguophile, lover of language. Another lover of language is a guy named Richard Lederer. He's written a number of books on language. He was host of a program called Away With Words, which was a PBS program, a radio program. He wrote this book called Crazy English, and he talks about how crazy the English language is and how sometimes self-contradictory the language is. This is just a little piece from that book. He says, let's face it, English is a crazy language. There is no egg in eggplant or ham in hamburger, neither apple nor pine in pineapple. English muffins were not invented in England or French fries in France. Sweet meats are candy, while sweet breads, which aren't sweet, are meat. We take English for granted, but if we explore its paradoxes, we find that quick sand can work slowly. Boxing rings, we call them boxing rings, but they're square. Why do we call them boxing rings? A guinea pig is neither from guinea nor is it a pig. And why is it that writers write, but fingers don't thing? Grocers don't gross and hammers don't ham. If the plural of, booth, of, of tooth is teeth, why isn't the plural of booth, beef? One goose, two geese. One moose, two meese. If teachers taught, past tense, why didn't preachers prot? If a vegetarian eats vegetables, what does a humanitarian eat? Get it? In what language do people recite at a play and play at a recital? We ship by truck and send cargo by ship. We have noses that run and feet that smell. Got to think about that one for a minute. We park on driveways. We park on driveways. We drive on parkways. How can a slim chance and a fat chance be the same thing? While well, a wise man and a wise guy are opposites. How can the weather be hot as hell one day and cold as hell another day? And when a house burns up, it actually burns down. You fill in a form by filling it out. And an alarm clock goes off by going on. When the stars are out, they are visible. But when the lights are out, they are invisible. And when I wind up my watch, I start it. But when I wind up this essay, I end it. You can see, the English language, and many languages are the same, are, are just bizarre. They're crazy. Yet what is amazing is they work. 
Language is incredibly ambiguous in many ways. Many jokes are based on the double meanings of words and so forth, and yet it works. And God chose language to reveal himself to us. His word comes to us in human language. So it's, it's a pretty important thing, this study of human language. Um, one of the questions I often get asked when I'm um, in my classes and, and when I'm preaching in churches is, which is the best translation to use? What translation should I use? Um, well, of course, I always say the best one, the only really good one is the NIV. So you should use the NIV. No, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't actually say that. When I'm asked that question, which translation uh, should I use, the, the answer used to be simple. When I was growing up, there was really only one English translation, really, that dominated the field. I memorized verses in that translation. Every time I went to church, that was the translation that was preached. What translation was that? The King James Version, right? The KJV dominated the field for 400 years. Sometimes I say it's the greatest translation, that, that English translation of all time. But of course, the KJV is showing its age now. It's hard for many people to understand because of its archaic language. And so now the answer is not so simple. It used to be simple. The King James Version was the Bible, but now we have a host of different versions. We have not just the King James, but the New King James. We have the Revised Standard, that's the revision of the King James, plus the New Revised Standard, plus the American Standard Version, plus the New American Standard Bible, plus the English Standard Version, plus the New English Bible, plus the Revised English Bible, plus the New International Version, plus the International Standard Version, plus the Today's English Version, plus the Living Bible, plus the New Living Translation, plus the New Century Version. You can almost get any word like, like new and international and version and put it together and you're going to come up with a version. They're running out of names, you can see, and, and abbreviations for these, these versions. So you go into a bookstore and you say, I'd like a Bible, please. And they say, which one? And they lead you to a shelf and there's all these Bibles. Which translation should I choose? Well, when I've asked that question, I always give the same answer. And it's not, no, it's not the NIV. That's the one you should choose. I always answer this. I always say, use more than one. It's a good idea to use more than one translation. Now, some people don't like that because they want the real Bible, right? They want the right Bible. But there's two reasons why you should use more than one. First of all, the first reason is because no translation is perfect. No translation can capture all of the meaning. We have a saying in English, something was lost in the translation. You ever heard that saying? Something was lost in that translation. And that is true. Something is always lost in translation. So no translation can capture all the meaning. But the top positive side of that is that all translations capture important aspects of meaning and capture different nuances of meaning. In that regard, it's especially important to use different kinds of translations. And we'll talk about what we mean by that. What does it mean to use different kinds of translations? Well, there's, there's basically, I'm, I'm sure you've heard, many of you have heard that, most of you probably heard this. There are two basic philosophies of translation, or two basic approaches to translation. We call one of them formal equivalence. That's kind of the, the technical term for it, also known as literal translation or word-for-word -word translation. The other one is called today functional equivalence used to be called dynamic equivalent, sometimes called idiomatic translation or meaning-based translation. And these are really two very different approaches to translation. Formal equivalent says you should follow the words of the text as much as possible. Follow the form of the original. So when one Greek word shows up, you should always try to translate that Greek word with the same English word. One Hebrew word, one-to-one -one correspondence. Or when there's a grammatical construction, like a prepositional phrase in Greek or in Hebrew, then we should translate that with a prepositional phrase in English. So formal equivalent says follow the form as closely as possible. Functional equivalent says no, it's not about the form of the language, it's about the meaning of the language. And different languages say the same thing in different ways. So you need to focus on what's the meaning of the text, not so much what's the form of the text. Now, these two translation philosophies have been competing for centuries. We can go back to the first century, to before the first century. We can go to China. Uh, we can go to um, the Arab countries. We can go to um, the European countries. And we find this debate going on. What's the best way to translate? In fact, every Bible version uses both those translation for formal and functional equivalents. The differences are really a matter of degree. 
They're on a continuum. So let me show you where most common English translations, we'll be talking about English translation here. English translations lie. Some of the more formal ones, the King James Version was quite formal. It actually wasn't, interestingly enough, it's probably the least literal of these translations, but it, but it is on this spectrum. The New King James Version, formal equivalent. The New Revised Standard Version, formal equivalent. The New American Standard Bible. Um, a, lot, a lot of you probably know and use that. The English Standard Version, uh, fairly recent version. Those are all more formal or literal versions. On the other side of the spectrum, the more functional, you've got versions like the Good News Translation, also known as Today's English Version, or Good News for Modern Man. Have you ever seen that little, um, um, little Bible called Good News for Modern Man with stick figure pictures all through it? Anyone use the Today's English Version? Some of you, some of you know that translation. The New Living Translation, that's probably the most popular, widely used of these functional equivalent ones, these idiomatic translations. The Contemporary English Version is the CEV, the New Century Version. That's a version I worked on with the revision. God's Word Translation, GW stands for God's Word. Maybe that's a little presumptuous to call your translation God's Word, but they're all God's Word. Right? Now notice I've, I put these on either side because really there's a whole bunch of translations that are somewhere in the middle between the more formal and the more functional. The NIV is one of those, the new international version, the most widely used English translation in the world. The NAB is called the New American Bible. That's a Roman Catholic translation. The CSB is the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, that's a Southern Baptist version recently come, came out. Uh, the NET is the New English Translation. And the CEB is the Common English Bible. Kind of an NIV-like translation. So these are some of the most widely used English translations, and they, they, they're across the spectrum. I could draw it this way. Here's the spectrum. More formal or literal on this side, and this is in your notes there, you can see it. More meaning-based on that side. And so on this far side, you can see probably the New American Standard. How many of you use an NASB? Got some of those. The NASB is probably the most formal or literal of these particular versions. There's, there's some that are more formal or literal. They're just not widely used today. On this side, the, the contemporary English version, the CEV, and then you can see in the middle, you've got the Holman Christian Standard or the CSB, the NIV, the ESV, and the Net Bible. Those are kind of more, a little bit more in the center there. Okay, so let's go, let's start. Which translation should I use? We, we have to start really with the question of what is the goal of translation? What are we trying to do when we translate a text? Let me just give you a definition and you see if you agree with me. Uh, the goal of translation is to take a text in one language and reproduce its meaning in another language. Now, linguists talk about, they talk about the source language on this side or the donor language and then the receptor language or the target language. For the Bible then, the source language of the Old Testament would be what? What's the, the Old Testament written in? Hebrew. Okay, so that would be the source or donor language. The New Testament is written in? Greek, so that would be the source or donor language. The receptor language would be in English for us, but certainly all over the world. We've got international Bible translators translating in every language around the world. So the goal is to take the text in this language and reproduce its meaning. Now, if this is the right definition, what's the goal of translation? What are you trying to achieve? What are you trying to reach? The meaning, thank you. Yeah, the, you're trying to reach the meaning of the text. Would, would you agree with that? You're trying to reach the meaning? I'm not trying to trick you. Well, yes, I am. In a way, I'm trying to trick you. The goal is to reproduce the meaning of the text. Uh, the, the, goal, the ultimate goal is not to reproduce the form of the text. The ultimate goal is to reproduce the meaning of the text. If that's the case, and I'll admit from the very beginning, I'm biased. You'll see I'm biased. Um, I would argue that meaning-based translation is actually more accurate translation. Now, we're going to talk about benefits of both kinds of translations, and, and I encourage you to, to use more than one translation, but in fact, meaning-based translation or functional equivalence is really the way real-world translation um, is, is done all around the world. Why, so why do we need translation at all? Some people say, just tell me what the Bible says, not what it means. I don't want interpretation. I don't want commentary. I just want you to tell me what the Bible says. What's the problem with that? If I tell you what the Bible says, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to give you Hebrew and Greek because that's what the Bible says. And so um, you can see right over here, that's a, a Hebrew manuscript. Um, can anyone read that here? Anyone? No. Look, at, look at the manuscript. That's actually one of our earliest manuscripts. What's it? It's missing there. There's no punctuation. 
There's no spaces hardly between words, you can see. They just run them, run them all together. My, my, my Greek students would have a hard time reading that because the letters are very different because the, there's, there's not the same punctuation and spacing and, and so forth. Um, so the, the, the problem with telling, just giving you what the Bible says is the Bible is written in a different language. Or we could say it this way, Estin panta elenikos moi. Well, that's Greek for it's all Greek to me. There's the problem is we can't translate word for word because it's, it's all Greek to me. Okay, someone says, I understand, you're right, it's a different language. Let's just then give me a word for word translation. Take each word in Greek and Hebrew and find an equivalent English word. Okay, that should work, right? What's the problem with that? Problem number two is words don't have just one meaning. Words don't have just me one meaning. What do I mean by that? Let's take the word key. Here's an English word key. What's the literal meaning of the word key? You can tell me. What's the literal meaning of the word key? Anyone? An object to unlock something. Say that. An object to unlock, uh, an object to unlock something. That's usually the first definition we think of, right? A key is, is an unlocking tool. Bing, bing, bing. Yes, you're right. The family feud, isn't that right? <laughs> okay. So that is, is that the literal meaning of the word key? An unlocking tool? What else can the word key mean? Important. Important, okay. Like I could say that's, that's the key point. Okay, that's going to come up in a second. That's not number two, so I can't go ding, ding, ding. Right here. What, what, else, what else might key mean? How, yes? The solution. the solution to a puzzle, right? Thank you, that's number two. Solution to a puzzle. That is the key to the puzzle. Um, main or primary, what was his key point? You might get to the end of this time and say, what was he talking about? What was his key point, right? What else can key mean? A key is like a legend on a map or a table of contents. Yeah, yeah, very good. That's not up here, actually. How about this? Anyone, any musicians around here? What does key mean in music? It's, it's musical pitch. You say, what key is that in? Or how about this? A button on a typewriter. Anyone remember typewriters? Anyone ever seen a typewriter in a museum? Right? Or a piano. You could have a keys on the piano. Exactly. So buttons of some kind, right? So we, we talk about a keyboard now, don't we? we? Talk about a keyboard. How about this one? A low offshore island. He lives in the Florida Keys. There's another one I don't have up here. If you play basketball, the key is a part of the basketball court, right? So, so here we go. What is the literal meaning of the word key? All of those, okay, all of those, or none of those, right? Does key have a literal meaning? We often say what, that this is the literal meaning of this word, and unless we mean non-figurative, you know, you've got a literal meaning, then you've got a metaphorical or figurative meaning, really, we almost always use that word wrong, because words don't have literal meanings. I have to say, I often cringe when I'm in church, when I'm hearing a teacher, and someone says, now, the literal meaning of that Greek word is, because about... 80, 90% of the time, what follows is actually wrong because words don't have literal meanings. What do words have? Words have a range of potential meanings. Words don't have a single literal meaning. They have a range of potential senses or meaning. Now, you might say, okay, but lots of words do have literal meanings, and you can kind of get a technical term, right? Like, a, let's say, transmission. Transmission on an engine, right? That's a pretty technical term. Does that mean one thing? No, right? A transmission. Could a radio transmission? Or almost every word, because there's so many ideas and there's a limited lexical stock or limited number of words, almost any word has multiple meanings. There is no literal meaning. Um, there is a range of potential senses, a semantic range, right? Let me illustrate this, that words don't have just one meaning. Here's a, a very simple Greek sentence. My students, my first year Greek students would be able to read that pretty quick. Um, Archetu evangelio Iesu Christu. And they would translate that the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fairly basic Greek, right? But, but let's look at each of these Greek words. The Greek word arche can mean beginning. That's how it's translated there, right? But it can also mean origin, ruler, authority, office, domain, cause, or corner as well. The word Euangelio is the word for gospel. That's the Greek word for gospel. It can mean good news. You could translate it, transliterate it like gospel, um, or it can mean an announcement in general. The, the word to you see here, that's actually the article, the. 
but it's in a case called the genitive case, so it can mean of the or from the or by the. Iesu, well, that's the Greek word for Jesus. But in Hebrew, it's Yeshua. Um, in um, the Old Testament, it's Joshua. Did you know that? Joshua and Jesus are the same words. One is from the Hebrew, one is from the Greek. Um, Christu is an, actually an adjective. It means smeared with oil or covered with oil. But it, it means anointed as well. You can to pour oil on something is to anoint it. And it came to mean the anointed one or the Messiah or the Christ. All of those come from the same word. Messiah is the Hebrew word for anointed. Christ is the transliteration of that word for the anointed one. Um, so though each of those words has a range of meanings. So this sentence could be, not, not the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but the source of the news about Josh who was smeared with oil. Okay. Now, how do we know that's not the right meaning? How do we know this is the right meaning of Mark 1.1? What's context? There's our key word. Um, when I'm teaching my hermeneutics class, I tell my students, almost every answer to the questions in this, this class are either Jesus or context. Choose one of those two, and you'll almost always be right, right? Okay, so word meanings. What is the literal meaning of the English word key? Key doesn't have an English, a literal meaning. It has a range of potential senses. So what do you need to do? In each particular context, you've got to determine what the meaning is in each context. So we have to find the right word in the receptor language in the, in, in the context, from the context. Okay, so let's do that with key. Let's do it with Spanish. Since we're in San Diego, we'll do a lot of Spanish tonight. Um, if you want to say an unlocking tool, you would say llave. If you want to say the solution to a puzzle, you would say clave. If you want to say musical pitch, you would say tono. If you want to say a button on a typewriter, you'd say tecla. There's a lot of other Spanish words that mean these things, too. There's one way you could say it. If you want to say a low offshore island, you'd say cayo. Now, what if I said, no, 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 no. You have to find one word. You have to find one word in Spanish and always use that one word whenever you see the word key. What would you say? That's crazy. That's just bad translation because words don't have one meaning. Words have a range of potential meanings. It's the same with the biblical languages. To say a literal, we need to translate it literally, one to one, is to go against the way that words work because words don't have one meaning. Words have a range of potential senses. So the same is true of the biblical language. Let's take a Greek word. Consider the Greek word logos. I'm sure many of you have heard that word. It's a very common word. We talk about it a lot in church. What's the literal meaning of the word logos? You're too smart for me. Is, is the literal meaning word? Do words have literal meanings? No. no. So it can't be the literal meaning, right? But that's what everyone would say, right? Word. Logos means word. We hear that a lot, don't we? Does what, logos mean word, right? Here's logos translated in the New American Standard. Now, remember I mentioned the New American Standard is probably the most literal translation, widely, viewed, widely available English translation. So let me show you how they translate logos. There it is. He cast our spirits with a word, uh, but let your statement be yes. A king who wished to settle accounts. I will also ask you one thing. This story was widely spread. Spread the news around, uh, stating the matter plainly. I will ask you one question. His message was with authority. Have a complaint against anyone. Had given them much exhortation. And you see, er in Greek, every one of those underlying words is logos. Every one of them. And in, the, in a very literal translation, it's translated as word, statement, accounts, things, story, news, matter, question, right? Because logos doesn't have one literal meaning. It usually relates in some sense to an act of communication. <coughs> Excuse me, you can see a lot of those up there, but it doesn't have one meaning. It has a whole range of nuances. It has a semantic range. And we've got to choose what it means in each context, what particular sense within that semantic range it means in each context, right? Here's the key principle from this first section here. Key principle is it is unreliable to translate words literally, one to one. You must translate them according to their meaning in context. So again, that means an idiomatic translation that is looking for the meaning of the word rather than just reproducing the same word in English is going to generally be more accurate. Let me illustrate this with a, um, a particular area, um, a topic that um, was a controversial topic. I don't know if, if you heard about it. it. It started in the late 90s. 
um, with, with what's called gender-inclusive language. And it, there was a big controversy. It was actually a controversy around the NIV, the New International Version, and some other versions. I actually got involved in this accidentally. I was interested in language, and I, started, I was writing on the area of gender language at the time. And when this controversy broke, people were saying, you're trying to, to neuter the Bible. You're trying to take gender out of the Bible. And I, from a linguistic perspective, I was looking at this, and I was saying, no, that's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to translate according to the meaning in context. So I started to write about this. It got kind of controversial. If you go online and look at this controversy, the, the gender-inclusive language controversy about um, 1990s and then 2000. 11 with the new NIV came out at that time. But here's one of the issues related to that. The Greek word anthropos, um, it's got a semantic range, a range of possible senses. One of those meanings is person. Uh, the other is man or male. Now, the primary sense, more often than not, it normally means person. Think of our word anthropology in English. Anthropology is the study of human beings. It's not the study of men or males. It's the study of human beings. So the Greek word anthropos can mean, or primarily means person, but sometimes means male, a man, um, traditionally translated man. Now, Romans 3.28, for we maintain that an anthropos is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Think with me, is that a person is justified by faith, or is that a man is justified by faith? It's a person. It means person, right? So look at this. The NIV, the 84, this is the original NIV, the 84, well, that's the first revision, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. The 2011 NIV said, and we maintain that a person is justified by faith. Now, back then, this was controversial. It's no longer controversial. But, but, but it was really, it was a big scandal. People were saying, you're, 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 you're trying to, you know, neutralize the Bible. G these are gender-neutral translations. <coughs> but what does it mean? Does it mean person or mean man? Which is more accurate? Now, there's, there's nothing wrong with man here, is there? Because it's being used generically. It means a human being. But which is more precise? Person is clearly more precise because man could mean a male or it could mean a person generally. So you're looking at the meaning in context. Let me give you another example. The plural of that is anthropoi. It can mean people or it can mean men, depending on the context. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 36, I tell you, on the day of judgment, anthropoi will give account, give an account. Is that men that are going to give an account, or is that people? Men. <laughs> My wife would say mostly men, right? Look at the RSV. I tell you, on the day of judgment, men will render account. Now, the RSV didn't mean men. They meant people, right? ESV, which is a revision of the RSV, by the way. I tell you that on that day, people will give an account, which is more accurate. People is more accurate because that's what it means in, in context. You're looking at the meaning of the word in its particular context. I'll give you one more. Here's Adelphoi. We get our word Philadelphia from this, right? Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Adelphoi is, means brothers. Uh, more commonly, though, it means siblings. It actually means brothers and sisters. So more commonly, it means siblings, but it can also mean male siblings as well. So Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. He says, my Adelphoi, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. Now, in this letter, he's writing to the church made up of men and women. In fact, he addresses two women in the church in the letter. Um, so what does he mean? Does he mean, therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, or therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for? You can see he means brothers and sisters. Now, again, nothing wrong with the NIV here, except brothers is not very inclusive today, is it? If I say the brothers are going to meet for breakfast, would the women show up? Probably not, right? In other words, it doesn't mean brothers commonly in English. It means brothers and sisters. So this is actually more accurate. Now, some people say, oh, but you need something more literal. But it's not more literal. It's no more literal. These are both part of the semantic range. Brothers and siblings are just two possible meanings. What tells you whether it's brothers or siblings? What's the key? Context tells you, right? So this translation is actually more accurate. More and more translations now are going in this direction. They're recognizing it's not about, you know, it's not about being politically correct over here. It's, it's not about trying to apply it to women as well as men. It's basically what the word means. The word means siblings. It means brothers and sisters in that context. All right. The key, here's our key. The key for the translator is to determine the meaning of each word in its context 
then find a word with an equivalent meaning in the receptor language. So that's words, right? Context determines the meaning of a word in each passage, right? So someone finally says, okay, then just look at the context, decide what the word means, then you can translate literally, right? Then you can go word by word after that. What's the problem with that? Well, here's our problem. The problem is it's not just words that are different, but languages use different phrases, clauses, and idioms to express the same meaning. In other words, languages are not just different in the meanings of, of words. They're also different in the grammatical structures that they use to express meaning. Here's a, 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 an example that I've used a lot in these kinds of lectures because we get it, people get it, particularly people who know a little Spanish. Right? Como se llama? What does como se llama mean? What's your name? Wrong. It means how yourself call. That's what it means, right? So como is a question word. How? Se is a reflexive pronoun. Uh, yourself. Yama is a verb call. So that's what it means. It means how yourself call. That's a literal translation of that. Is that a good translation? We could smooth that out and say, how do you call yourself? I jokingly tell my students, that's an NASB translation of the, no, I'm just kidding. I love the NASB. I, I love all translations. How do you call, but we wouldn't say, how do you call yourself, would we? We'd say, what's your name? Is that a good translation, what's your name? But you've completely messed up the grammar, right? The original grammar was a question word, como, a reflexive pronoun, say, a verb, yama. This is a question word, what, the verb to be is a possessive pronoun, your, and a noun name. You have changed every grammatical form in that sentence. But what have you retained? The meaning. You've retained the meaning. So you can see, the key is to retain the meaning. Whatever it takes to change the form, it's to retain, it's to retain the meaning. Here's another example. Pomme de terre. We'll go to French for a minute here. Pomme de terre. Anyone speak a little French? Okay, a, an apple, palma, de terre, an apple of the earth, right? What did I hear over here? A potato, right? Is this an apple of the earth or is this a potato? Well, this is a literal translation, apple of earth. But I would never say, uh, I'd like a steak and an apple of the earth, please. Right? Put, put some sour cream and chives on that apple of the earth. No, because that's, you don't translate literally. What do you do? You translate according to the meaning in context. Now, if you were to go to the United Nations and there was someone up front speaking some language and there was a, a, a hundred simultaneous translations going on at that time, not a single one of those translators would be translating word for word or literally. They'd get fired if they did immediately because they wouldn't, it would be gibberish, right? What they're doing, they're hearing it and they're saying, how do we say it in our language? And they change the form in order to communicate the meaning. So idiomatic or meaning-based translation is basically the way translation is done around the world. All right. Here's another example. Déjeuner is French for lunch. So if I say petit déjeuner, petit means small or little. So what, what would that be? <laughs> okay, I have some French speakers here. It, we, we would say a little lunch, but in fact, it's not, it's not a little lunch. It's actually breakfast. It's actually breakfast. It's like that um, comedian, amateur linguist, Steve Martin, said those French. It's like they've got a different word for everything. It's crazy. Okay, so we need translation because no two languages are the same in terms of idioms, in terms of collocations, and a host of other ways. I want to talk about these two, so I just listed these two, idioms and collocations, because these are both kind of fun. What's an idiom? An idiom is a word, or a phrase, or a sentence it has a different meaning than the literal meaning of its parts. So by definition, you can't translate an idiom literally because it, that's just what idiom means. It's, it's not literal, right? A phrase or expression with a meaning differing from the literal meaning of its parts. So we, have, we use hundreds and hundreds of idioms. In fact, we talk about language being idiomatic. That's from that same word. Idiomatic means each language is unique. Each language has its own way of saying things. So let me do a little Spanish, some Spanish idioms. Um, ser pan comido means to be bread eaten. To be bread eaten. Anyone know what that means? I, have, I found these online, so I don't know whether they're, what, what dialect of Spanish they're from. To be bread eaten literally means to be bread eaten. It means to be easy. 
to be easy. Or we might say to be a piece of cake. Now there's an English idiom. What if you translated literally to be a piece of cake? How would that translate into Spanish? It wouldn't. The idiom doesn't work. The idiom doesn't work either way, right? Here's another idiom in, Sp in Spanish. Empezar la casa por el tejado. Literally, to start the house by the roof. To start the house by the roof. What does that mean? Oh, nice. Who said that? To get the cart before the horse. Look at that, right? To do things in the wrong order, basically. To do things backwards. We would say to put the cart before the horse. Um, estar hecho un ahi, this is one of my favorites. Literally, to be made a chili. To be made a chili. It means to be very angry. You made a chili? That works, kind of. Okay. We might say to be hopping mad. I don't know, what would we say in English? Right. This is my favorite. A pie de letra. A pie de letra means at the or to the foot of the letter. To the foot of the letter. What does that idiom mean? It means literally, or word for word. So in Spanish, you can't even say literally, literally. You have to say it idiomatically, right? Okay, what if I said, um, suppose I was visiting from out of town, I said, by the way, I'm hitting the road at the crack of dawn. Let's, let's, let's tra translate this into um, a literal translation. By the way, I would say, along the path, right? I'm hitting the road. I'm punching the street. At the crack of dawn, that was a hard one. I, how about this? At the fissure of sunrise. <laughs> Along the path, I'm punching the street at the fissure of sunrise, right? That's what it literally means. But I've lost it completely because it's an idiom, and idioms don't say what they mean. Instead, I should say something like, I wanted to let you know I'm leaving very early in the morning, right? Now, I've completely messed up the grammar, right? I've completely messed up the words. The idiom doesn't work in English. Now, something was lost in the translation. That's true. Something is lost. Something is always lost in the translation. But th this captures the meaning. What you've gotten, what you've retained, is the, basic, is the basic meaning. Let me give you a couple examples. I don't want to pit on, pick on any one translation, but the more formal or literal ones tend to reproduce the idiom without necessarily taking account of what it actually means. So here's just a, an example. Um, the ESV says in Luke 22, 3, Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. Who was of the number, I read that and I thought, of the number of the twelve. Would we ever say that in English? But I would say, he was of the number of the elders at the church. Uh, no, what would I say? Well, how, would, how would you say that in English? He was one of. He was one of the twelve, right? Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. That's the idiom in English we would use. We wouldn't say of the number of. Of the number of is a Greek idiom. It's not an English one. So by following, trying to follow the idiom, literally, we're missing the meaning, right? 1 Corinthians 9, 16. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast, for necessity is laid upon me. What does that mean? Necessity is laid upon me. The NIV says, since I am compelled to preach, I am compelled to. The NLT says, I am compelled by God to do it. Necessity is laid upon me is a Greek idiom. It's not an English one. We would never say, I really got to do that. Necessity is laid upon me right now. Really, I would never, never say that in English. Right? Mark 1, 2. Behold, I send my messenger before your face. There's a quote from Isaiah. I send my messenger before your face. What does that mean, before your face? In person, it actually means ahead of you. I will send my messenger ahead of you, right? I would never say, she got to the restaurant before my face, right? <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. That's not English, right? Now, this is interesting. Notice that this is the New American Standard, the uh, 1970, done in the 70s, 78, I think. Behold, I send a messenger before your face. The NASU, 1995, they changed it. Behold, my messenger... I I send my messenger ahead of you, because they recognize this is an idiom. This is just what it means. So as they revised it, they revised it more accurately. Uh, 2 Samuel 18, 25, the New King James said, David is, this is a, David is at the city, and he's watching his, their way at battle, and he's watching for a messenger, and he sees a messenger coming from a distance. And he says, if he is alone, there is news in his mouth. 
That's the New King James Version. There is news in his mouth. If he is alone, he is, there is news in his mouth. What does that mean? He has a message, okay? Right? The king said, if he is alone, he must have good news. Now, what it was is, is your, your, your army is away fighting. If one guy comes running back, you know you won, right? Because this is a messenger. If everybody comes running back, what are they doing? They're retreating. So that's what the, the, the idiom means, right? If he's alone, then he's got good news. Um, the, the idiom, the, the Hebrew idiom is there's news in his mouth. But I would never say, here comes Johnny, and there's news in his mouth, right? You'd never say that. That's just not English. That's, that. So you see, there's a tendency among the more literal versions to reproduce the idiom without thinking, what does this actually mean in English? And how do we say it, right? The Holman Christian Standard says, if he is alone, he bears good news. This, this one I came across, and I, I was trying to figure out. Uh, Amos 4, 6, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities. This is, a, this is a judgment oracle. God is judging them. He says, I gave you cleanness of teeth. What does that mean? I thought he's distributing toothbrushes or something, right? Well, here's the NIV says, I gave you empty stomachs. And a cleanness of teeth means there's nothing in your mouth. And so you're starving to death because there's famine. Then that Bible says, I gave you no food to eat in any of your cities. So again, it's an idiom. You have to say, what does the idiom mean and how do you say it in English? Here's the point. Translating idioms literally doesn't work because idioms don't mean what they say. So we have to find an appropriate idiom in the receptor language, right? Collocations are fun. I, I, this will be the last one that we do in terms of uh, language. Collocations. What's a collocation? We don't use that word much in English. It's kind of a technical term. A collocation is a word that gets its meaning from the word it's paired with. What's called, it's collocate. So for example, words whose meaning comes from their relationship with other words. Their relationship with other words. So let me illustrate this for you. Uh, take a word like make in English. What can you make in English? Well, you can make a whole lot of different things if you start thinking about it. Let me give you some examples. You can make pancakes. You can make trouble. You can make up. You can make sense. You can make friends. You can make a plane. Now, you can build a plane, but you can also catch a plane. Now, think about that. In English, we say catch a plane. We're not catching the plane, right? That's a collocation with catch, right? Make a deal. Oh, make a difference, sorry. Make a vow. Make love. Make sergeant. Make Paris in a day. Reach Paris in a day. You can't make Paris in a day either. It takes a long time to make. So, so look at this. What do each of these things mean? Make pancakes means put together the ingredients for pancakes. Make trouble means to cause trouble. Make up means to reconcile. Make sense means to be clear. Make friends, establish a relationship. Make a plane, either build a plane or reach a plane in time to, to, to take off with it. Make a deal, make a difference, uh, make a vow. You can see make means something dramatically different in each of these collocations. And it's the word it's paired with that gives it its meaning. Now, why is this important for translation? The problem is when you move into another language, the collocate almost never works. In Spanish, for example, you don't take a walk. What do you do? You dar un paseo. You give a walk. Well, you give a walk. That doesn't make sense. Well, it's the collocation. It's a different, it's a different collocation. So um, let's do this in, in Greek for the New Testament. The Greek word for make, if I, my Greek students would tell you, it's, it's poieo. That's the Greek word for make. Stan, most standard word for make is poieo. It means make or do. The problem is you can't poieo almost any of those things I just showed you. You have to use a different word for all those. And what can you make in, in Greek? A plant makes fruit. A tree makes fruit. What would we say in, in, in English? We would not say that tree makes fruit. We would say what? produces or bears fruit, right? Grows fruit. Matthew 7, 22. Uh, Jesus makes miracles. That's not quite right, is it? What would we say in English? Performs miracles. Or, right? Matthew 26, 18. Jesus goes to Jerusalem to make Passover. What would we say? Observe or celebrate Passover, right? Keep Passover. Uh, Mark 3, 14. Jesus calls all of his disciples, and from, from the many disciples, he makes 12. He doesn't go, poof, makes 12. What does he do? Well, he chooses or appoints 12, exactly, right? 
Mark 15, 7, Barabbas makes murder. In the insurrection, he makes murder. And you see, these are all poieo. In Greek, these are all poieo. But we can't say make for any of them. We have to find the English collocation in this case. We would say he commits, he commits murder. I was talking to an international translator who's a friend. He, he, he and his wife were in Irian Jaya, translating in a tribal language in Irian Jaya. And I was learning all this stuff. I was fascinated by language. So I said to him, I said, are the idioms difficult in your language? Is it, you know, this uh, language, a remote tribal language? And he said, they don't have a lot of idioms. English has tons of idioms. They don't have a lot of idioms, he said. But then he said, the collocations are a nightmare. That's what he said. The collocations are a nightmare. Because nothing matches up. You learn make something and you can't make it, you can't use that word for anything else. You have to learn the specific collocation that is used in that particular, that particular language. So what we could do is then we could take any collocation here, like keep, and we could make a whole bunch of other collocations in English, none of which would, would match, right? Uh, the, the Greek word for keep is terao, and yet you can't terao any of these things. You can keep time in English, you can keep out, you can keep to yourself, you can keep quiet, you can keep the peace, you can keep sheep in your backyard, you can keep going, you can keep a bargain. Notice that it's not just that keep means a lot of different things. It means what it means because of the word it's paired with. It's, it's collocation. And so we, we have to determine in each context what the word means and translate accordingly. Here's our key principle. In each case, the translator must determine the meaning of the collocation in the source language and then find one with an equivalent meaning in the receptor language. Now you can see where I'm going. I told you I was biased from the beginning, right? You can see where we're headed here. Meaning is the key, determining what the text means first and then finding an equivalent meaning in English. Uh, in summary, languages say the same thing in different ways, using different forms. What does that mean? It means that translators must be in a constant mode of interpretation. You can't translate. Some people say, don't interpret, just translate. You can't translate without deter interpreting, without determining what the word means in context. From a linguistic perspective, there's no question that a meaning-based approach is more reliable. You can see, that's where I've been going. But what did I say at the very beginning with reference to translations? Which translation should you use? Use more than one. You should always use more than one because there are benefits to more formal or more literal translations. Even though they don't communicate quite as no standard in standard English, there are benefits. So just to close us out here, and then we'll take some Q&A, um, let me just give you a couple of strengths and weaknesses. Well, strengths. We'll focus on the strengths of each of these kinds of translations, of formal and functional. I'll just give you a few of each here. Um, formal equivalent versions are helpful for identifying the formal structure of the original text. In other words, if you're studying Greek and you want to see what it means, look at the NASB. You'll see what each word means. My students love formal equivalent translations. My Greek students love formal equivalent translations because it gives them a crib sheet, a cheat sheet for their exercises. So here's just an example. This is Greek. The Greek... Um, it's pretty much word for word in the NASB. The freedom cases of the glory, doxes, tone of the technon, children, to the u, of God. I mean, you can back translate it. In other words, you, you, you can take this and you can translate it right back into the Greek because it's just using word for word. They might go, what does that mean? What is the freedom of the glory of the children of God? That's a hard sentence to unravel. But what have they done? They've, they've lined up each word. So it helps you to see the structure, what the original Greek says. Here's a second strength of a formal equivalent, is tracing repeated words and verbal allusions. What do I mean by that? A verbal allusion. Sometimes a word will refer back to another word. It might have a different meaning in this context, but it's making an allusion back. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. Here's the New American Standard. It says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and he says, I, as a master builder, I laid a foundation. Now other people are building on it. He uses a building analogy, like a, a, a contractor. He says, I was the contractor. I laid the foundation. Others are building on it. Now notice that the NASB translates this Greek word sophos as wise. But we don't usually call builders wise, do we? We're actually remodeling our kitchen right now. We've got a great contractor. He's fabulous. But I would not say he's a wise contractor. He might be, but I don't know, right? He's an expert contractor, or he's a skilled contractor. I do something like that. And so most translations say something like, according to the grace God has given me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. 
Some say an expert master builder. Those are both good translations of the meaning in context. But there's a problem here. Sophos means expert, but Paul is alluding back to chapter 1. If you read chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, he talks about, he's contrasting the wisdom of God, the foolishness of God and the wisdom of man. And, and the, the wisdom in that sense is the cross of Christ. The power and wisdom of God is the cross of Christ. And so it's the scandal of the cross that's the wisdom. So when Paul says he's building um, um, as a Sophos builder, he means he's building on the cross of Christ. You can see you miss that if you say skilled. You miss the allusion back to wisdom in, the, in chapter 1. The 2011 NIV changed. The, the, the original NIV said an expert builder, but they changed to a wise builder. Now, that's not as smooth, is it, a wise builder, but it captures the allusion back to chapter 1, where Paul is using this word wisdom in, in this particular way. So do you see the point? The point is that a more formal or literal, it may miss the meaning a little bit, but it captures, captures the illusion. It picks up something that's significant in the text. Okay, here's a third strength, re reproducing Greek metaphors and idioms. Sometimes you want to see the idiom or the metaphor. Here's a good example. New King James Version says in Acts 11, 21, the hand of the Lord was with them. The hand of the Lord was with them. Some idiomatic translations say things like the power of the Lord was with them. Because hand is being used as power. But this is an anthropomorphism. God is being portrayed as a mighty warrior. And so to, to see that particular literal, more literal or formal illusion um, help, helps you understand a little bit the, the background to the text. So it captures, um, it captures um, idioms, it captures uh, metaphors is what I'm looking for, right? The, the NIV keeps the metaphor there in that case. The Lord's hand was with them. All right, those are some strengths of formal equivalence. Let me give you a couple of strengths of functional equivalence. We've been looking at these. Communicating accurately the meaning of the text. There's the key that we've been looking at um, this whole time here. Hear me, let me give you an example. Parable of the prodigal son. The New King James Version. As the father is waiting by the road. Remember the prodigal has gone away, squandered the inheritance. He's, he's coming back. The father sees him from afar the NKG says, NKJV says, his father saw him and ran and fell on his neck. Now, that's a literal version. That's what, what literally it says. It's, it uses the word fall and it uses the word neck. Um, but is that what that idiom means? He fell on his neck? That's what I would have done to that kid after he squandered the inheritance. I'd fall, you know. But what, what does fall on his neck mean in this context? Hugged him. He embraced him, right? So the New Living Translation, his father saw him coming and ran to him and embraced him. Or hugged him, right? That's what the idiom means, so you can see. The functional equivalence asks, what does the idiom mean? Finally, natu or natural language, uh, more normal language. The New American Standard uses this uh, Greek and Hebrew idiom. Opening his mouth, he began to teach them saying. Now, that's a, that's a Greek idiom. He opened his mouth and said. Opening his mouth, he said. But we would never say that in English. We would never say, he opened his mouth and began to speak. It's not two actions, it's one action. It basically means he began to speak. And so functional equivalence translations simply say he began to teach them. All right, finally, a, th a third strength of functional equivalence is clarity, is clarity. Here's the e English Standard Version, Hebrews 1.3. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. Now, at first glance, that sounds great, but what does that mean by the... He upholds all things by the word of his power. Word of his power. That doesn't make any sense in English. A word of his power. What, is, what does that mean? Well, functional equivalent, sustaining all things by his powerful word. His word. He merely speaks and it happens. So it pursues clarity. How do we say this in English? How do we make it clear in English? All right, here's our conclusion. A translation is not just about replacing words, but about reproducing meaning, right? At the same time, both kinds of translations are helpful tools for Bible study. Both are useful. Here's Martin Luther. Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer um, in the 16th century, translated the Bible from Greek and Hebrew into his idiomatic German. And that, that translation profoundly affected the German language because he, he learned to translate idiomatically. He was one of the earliest advocates of idiomatic translation. This is what he said. He said, I must, learn the literal, I must let the literal words go 
and try to learn how the German says that which the Hebrew expresses. Whoever would speak German must not use Hebrew style. Rather, he must see to it, once he understands the Hebrew author, that he concentrates on the sense of the text, asking himself, pray tell, what do the Germans say in such a situation? This is interesting because this is in the 1600s, or the 1500s, he's, he's writing this. He's anticipating what modern translators were going to be doing hundreds of years later. He says, let him drop the Hebrew words and express the meaning freely in the best German he knows. Martin Luther understood that translation is not just about replacing words, but about reproducing meaning. Therefore, making the riches of God's word understandable to people everywhere. If you go around the world to international Bible translators, they're almost all translating this way. No one translates literally word for word. They, they first of all determine how do you say it in, in this language? How do we say it in ours? How would we express that same meaning in our language? 